I was comfortably seated in my chair on the commandment bridge of the KUSC chasm when it happened. We were on a routine patrol mission, when I suddenly felt a sense of dread and unease. Judging by the reaction of the crew, I wasn't the only one. That could only mean one thing. A FTL jump. Stucci, there weren't any FTL jumps scheduled for today, no. I confirm, Capitan. Sensors, localize the origin of the pulse. Comms, contact High Command, and watch for potential EM communications from the unknown craft. All fighters on position. I want our weapons ready yesterday. I don't know what that is, but it can't be good. My mind was racing. There was only about 100 FTL-capable ships in the entire Chrysiok Union, and they were rarely used, so this was more than worrying. Had it been stolen for some strange purpose by a terrorist organization? A FTL ship could be a real weapon of mass destruction. A jump next to an inhabited planet would be devastating. Our chance was that the ship would have to rely solely on its AIs until the crew was resurrected. We localized it, sir. It's about 15 light minutes away. All Cressioc units were translated to the metric system for ease of reading. Skipper, get ready for mass suppression. Place us around 200 kilometers from them. We arrived at our position what felt like seconds later. Of course, 15 minutes had actually passed for static observers due to relativity. It was a problem, especially for interstellar travel, but most people were competent with never leaving their cave of birth, let alone their star system. Sir, High Command confirms no FTL ships are missing. This one is unknown. Unknown? What does that mean? It's aliens. We got their structural analysis done. I'm sending it to your screen. I gasped in horror. The ship before me was like a nightmare brought back from our own past, a caricature of our first ships, as seen by the opponents to expansion. It was an assortment of module agglomerated on a central beam, with the propulsion on its back and habitation and cargo on the front, with rotating rings as a mean of artificial gravity. There were also gigantic radiator panels to dissipate heat, and descent modules for planets with and without atmosphere. All in all, it wasn't too different from the ships our ancestors built to conquer the stars, with one glaring difference, the large pieces of glass in the hull. They were everywhere along the habitation modules, and on the very front of the ship there was a structure looking like a cupola, composed of many glass panels. Is... is that? We shouldn't make hasty conclusions. It could be optics for their sensors, as far as we know. Still, it felt wrong. I tried very hard not to imagine what being on this ships would feel like. I was breathing heavily, trying to control my fear. Windows. On a spaceship. You could see with your own eyes what was already unbearable in pictures. You could, no, with that many windows you would gaze into infinity. Besides, the amount of light entering through those would be unbearable. Sir, they appear to want to communicate through radio waves. Well, open a channel. Hmm, sir, we haven't deciphered their language yet. Right, I didn't think of that. I can be dumb sometimes. Well, apparently they did, sir. It appears they are transmitting us data about their language first. Shit, did I say that out loud? All the AIs the government could spare are working on it, and they recommend we send them data of our own, in case they're better at translation than us. And so we waited, and waited for an another good fifteen minutes before finally... I receive a clear communication, sir. It appears they have translated our language. What do we do? Wait for the Council's orders. We can't take initiatives in this situation. My experience taught me it was almost always better to not take any decisions by yourself about something out of your expertise. First contact with an alien race was certainly in this category. The council speaker said it will take a few hours to open an emergency session. You are asked to handle first contact by yourself during this time. What? Me, a military officier, being entrusted to represent my species to an alien race? What was the speaker thinking? I then realized that everyone, not just me, had been caught by surprise with that first contact, and that our civilization as a whole was unprepared for it. The idea life could have appeared elsewhere in the universe never crossed our mind, let alone intelligent life. Beside, I would have assumed becoming spacefaring was rather rare, since we only did it because of the Great Crisis. I closed my eyes and sighed deeply. Open a channel. 
There was only audio, and the talking was done by a translation AI, so it was more like a glorified textual exchange. I began communication. Greetings. I am Captain Mirkel of the KUSC CHASM. I welcome you on behalf of all Cressiokind. Please recontact me when a biological crew member will be ready for conversation. That should buy me some time to think about what to do. With any luck, resurrection will face unexpected issue, and the Council would have assembled by then. I am biological and ready for conversation. I could barely contain my surprise and began to panic. Had I already messed up? I apologize if my prior remark insulted you in any way. I didn't think. Don't worry. Your remark just sparked my curiosity. I am Nurse Jonathan Hart, leader of this expedition. Nurse? That's an interesting title. Ah, it seems there was a translation error. Not important for now, just... I am not a nurse. Very well. May I know why you came to this system rather than our capital to establish contact? Well, we didn't plan to establish contact. We stumbled onto you by pure chance. Wait, really? How did you not know the system was inhabited? Judging by its appearance, your technology is far more advanced than ours. I assume you fully transitioned to quantum entanglement for communication, and that can't be detected. So to our senses, you were completely invisible. I nodded. That did make sense. I didn't think of that. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm probably not qualified for this, but the government wants me to handle first contact until they're ready, so I'd prefer to not begin negotiations right now. I heard the synthetic voice imitating poorly laughter. Sorry, it's just... I am in a similar situation to yours and received explicit orders not to begin negotiations. That was a relief. So, what shall we do while our respective governments ready themselves? Well, we could talk about our respective cultures to improve our translation and learn about possible accidental insults our real diplomats should avoid. Good idea. Well, is there anything you want to know about us? There was, of course. A lot of things, actually. But one question in particular I couldn't hold any longer. This glass in your hull, is it? I mean, can you see... I was struggling to formulate the question. I had been holding well so far, but it wouldn't last. As I was distracted by other subjects, I could contain it in the back of my mind. But now it flooded my mind and froze it solid. The absolute horror that is witnessing space with your own eyes, a terror so ancestral and so strong that it could actually kill you. It was simply so incomprehensibly vast that even if you survived, your mind would be irredeemably destroyed. I began to wonder, how long had I been in this state of mind now? It felt as if time itself was stretching and bending, as I was losing my grasp on reality. Well, what is your question? In an instant I was brought back to my sense. I felt stronger, more prepared, as if experiencing this fear made me slightly more immune to it. Does your ship has windows? Yes. It is crucial for morale so that you don't feel like you're trapped in a metal box, even if it kind of is the case. Besides, who would want to go in space and not being able to see it with their own eyes? Kresiox. We never reacted well even to the surface, so... Wait, you guys are a subterranean species? Yes, of course. You're telling me you can live on the surface? Yes. But how? The surface is barren and... Oh, that was a lesson learned. In first contact, do not assume anything. And I do mean anything, because what seems the norm to you may just well be an anomaly specific to your race. I assume the surface of your world is livable, that you evolved there, and as such are used to seeing the sky and the stars. More than that, we actively seek it. Seeing our planet with our own eyes always was a dream of our species. All civilizations we formed studied the stars before inventing agriculture. Being born in an age that allows us to explore the stars feels like a great privilege, and all members of our crew dreamed of their job since they were children. Wow, I don't know what to say. Was it just me or their voice synthesizer was getting better? At first it sounded like a monotonous robot, but now there was much more intonation. When Jonathan talked about space, you could hear the joy and excitement in his synthetic voice. Oh yes, I have another question. What was your mission, since you didn't plan on finding us? Exploring and studying star systems. 
It was a purely scientific mission. We were not looking for resources or potential colonies. A scientific mission. Was it requested by an AI or by an... It was requested by the scientific community as a whole. We were eager to... You said we. Are... Are you a scientist? Yes, like most of the crew. After all, this is also a very good occasion to pursue our own research. I, for example, study the formation and evolution of asteroid belts. Okay. So not only humans still had scientists, they trusted them with an FTL-capable ship and to perform first contact. What? The fuck? These drug-addicted sociopaths shouldn't even leave their facilities under any circumstance. They were a necessary evil at some point, but we replaced them with AI as soon as we could, probably for the best. If you can't understand something without taking a chemical that forever changes you as a person and locks you out of true adulthood, you shouldn't try to understand it in the first place. And now the humans arrived and apparently treated these, these pale husk of what could have been a functioning member of society like normal people. That was too far. I now knew why humans could look at space without losing their mind. They didn't have one to begin with. How could you let such menaces to society in control how what is essentially a weapon of mass cognitive destruction? Is everything all right? You've been silent for a while. I cannot talk to you. Please don't contact us until your government is ready. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? You're a scientist. What are you doing in command of a spaceship? Okay, there clearly was a problem with the translation. If you're having this kind of reaction, then there is no other explanation. Send us all your data about scientists, and we'll find an explanation in no time. I obliged. I hated myself so much, I almost screwed up first contact without even considering it could have been a material failure. Of course, the humans would never allow a scientist on a spaceship. I just had to wait, and I would have my answers. So I waited, and waited, and waited. After ten minutes, the humans asked for our knowledge on neuroscience. I gave them and waited for nearly twenty minutes before they asked for new data. This time, it was history. It was only after transmitting the data did I realize that I had been tricked into handing them potentially sensitive info. Well, at least it was just the stuff publicly available on the networks. Or at least I thought it was. Did I just leak classified data to another race? Every time I felt like I couldn't do worse, I still managed to screw up. My career was over after today, and the humans didn't talk, and so I waited and waited. And waited and waited, waited for nearly an hour before they spoke again. Hello again. Sorry for the long wait, but we figured something crucial about you, or maybe us. Unlike you, we have Neotini. What? We still display childlike characteristics as humans. To use a Krizioc saying, we are locked out of true adulthood. No. You, however, can reach true adulthood. By that I mean your brain loses its plasticity. You can only truly learn new concepts until your late teenage years. No. But that's not enough to learn all you need to know, at least for some positions. And besides, a good scientist keeps learning throughout their life. Comms, cut the channel. Sorry, sir, but the speaker's orders are clear. The channel must remain open in all circumstances. So they needed a way to prevent their brain from fossilizing, and they found one, a combination of herbs transformed with time on a powerful drug. The voice had definitely gotten more subtle. I could hear the mix of morbid fascination and contained anger as the alien described the most shameful part of our history. They were outcasts, a menace, but you couldn't get rid of them because you needed them to save you from your own incompetence, I will not act like my own people did not cause a similar catastrophe by their own stupidity, but still, you needed them to solve your great crisis. They pushed you to the stars you were so afraid of, launched your civilization on the path of progress, and in return, you replaced them with A's of their own making. Yeah, and so, the danger was real. You couldn't trust these freaks. You gave up on understanding your own technology, placed everything in the hand of machines, rather than those of your kind different from you, even if that meant nearly stopping your technological development. What do you mean, stopped? How long ago did you think we sent our first satellite into orbit? What does that have to do with your point? I thought for a bit. I don't know, 2,000 years ago. 
That sounded a bit low. It probably was more like twenty-five hundred years. Two thousand years ago? He laughed. We were too busy killing each other with swords for agricultural land back then. It was more like two hundred twenty years ago. That's impossible. Even with our most advanced AIs, we haven't made a significant breakthrough since... I stopped talking. The human had made his point. And in a final display of hate for those you called scientists, but thought of as witches, you even gave up the FTL drives they invented for less efficient subluminic ones. Wait, what? We never gave up FTL. Oh, yeah. Then why didn't you use it when intercepting us? I realize it's probably faster for you, but resurrecting a Cressioc from the no-life states can take hours. Wait, FTL kills you? It was like the mask of cold anger had suddenly melted, reveling the same curious and enthusiastic explorer as before. And he asked a question that should never be won. FTL kills you. This statement was the most common of knowledge, at least I thought. Never make assumptions in first contact. You're immune to FTL jumps. Well, you feel something the first few times, but you get used to it. Guess our brain can just adapt to the things we see, unlike yours. You see something during FTL? Well, there's some erratic activity in the brain that can impair your vision. I suppose this is what kills you. But yes, if you look through the window while in hyperspace... The thought of looking directly at hyperspace was too much for my poor mind to handle after this exhausting day. I fainted.